Three, two, one. He went one, early. two, three, and a bit. There you go. It's good. Oh! <laughs> Ah! MVP. He, and MVP. To be fair, cheated. MVP had to change course as well. <laughs> <laughs> who is that gentleman? That gentleman was fast. I couldn't tell who it was. His jersey's like 184. By the way, I see you representing the Niners. Go Joe Montana. No, no. Right on. <laughs> What's up, guys? Welcome to a brand new episode of Good Guy, Bad Guy. I'm Daniel Cormier. That's Phil Sunday. Phil, my idea of what I look like running was much different than what was actually happening. I could feel MVP just pulling away from me. And I kind of wanted to pull up lame so that I did not actually lose. But, Phil, what about that? You like it? This is not the Niners. Or, this is not the Niners. These are the Gunners, Phil. The Arsenal Gunners. I'm in London. I got a tour today from my favorite football club in England, the Arsenal Gunners. What do you think, Chael? Do I look fancy? Nah, man, but you're doing your job well. I've done this before, too. You commit to something. It's two months away. You think the day will never come. The last thing in the world that you want to do is go tour a football team in England. But here you are. You can't say no to people, Daniel. You said yes to this one. You're going to have to bite the bullet, get out there, do it, and then tell Sandra, don't ever put me on my calendar again. I don't want to watch football <laughs> done with your feet. You're crazy, dude. I absolutely love it. Chael, I'm in London now as I get ready to head to Abu Dhabi next weekend. But last weekend, we were in Manchester for UFC 304. Look, Bilal Muhammad won the welterweight championship of the world and told us all he would win the welterweight championship of the world. Were you surprised at how it went down between him and Leon Edwards? He's out of his mind. This guy lost. He claimed that he could beat Leon, which he'd already fought Leon for one completed round, and he did not beat him. So it was a very weird claim to start with. And then when the fight was over, he thought he was out there looking like Canelo because he, he landed a jab or two. Before you think I'm uh, teasing Blahal, hey, there's something to be said for confidence, Daniel. I mean, the Mark Branch story of going into the NCAA tournament with eight wins and seven losses and winning the whole thing, it's real. And then he returns to the finals all four years because you give a guy confidence, it changes everything. I don't know where Mohammed got it. I'm not sure he did not brainwash himself. I'm not sure he didn't look in the mirror and do the da daily affirmation of I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. Enough times that he actually believes it real. He believed he could out grapple. He believed he could out struck. He, he believed he could out pressure Leon. He can do none of those things. Well, no, excuse me. Apparently he can, but I don't know how or where he had the time. For this kind of growth, that was a completely different fight than their first contest. And I mean this as a compliment. You know, I was watching the fight and I got to thinking, if we watched those guys fight, Chael, before we saw Leon defend takedowns against Kamara, before we saw Leon defend takedowns against Kobe, this is kind of what you would have expected. But they had changed so much. And Bilal Muhammad had changed. But you didn't know. That he would come out and literally look like Khabib Nurmagomedov. He was forward on the gas the entire time. He did not get tired. You know what was the craziest thing to me, Chael? Every time he went to the corner, he looked like he might be fatiguing again. But the moment he got off that stool and he got back to fighting, he was right back forward. He was right back in Leon's face. And he was able to take him down as effectively as we have seen Leon, Leon Edwards taken down in a really long time. We have not seen anyone do that to him since Kamaru Usman did it to him the first time. This guy, Bilal Muhammad, fought the absolute perfect fight for him to become the champion. Now, Leon Edwards is a great champion. And his question or answer to me after was very telling. He goes, I was just very tired. I was just very tired all week. I couldn't really get my bearings. But I got to tell you something, man. It's to Bilal Muhammad's credit that he was able to put a guy on his heels the entire time when especially Leon knew he couldn't go backwards. But because Bilal was so intent on pressuring him, taking him down, it was beautiful, Chael. And the takedowns were beautiful because every single time he shot, he immediately locked his hands. So Leon never had a chance to defend in the way that he did in those two previous fights.
Yeah. You got to really know where you are out there. Like, one thing about Khabib, Khabib will take you down. But before he takes you down, he's going to cut you off and he's going to push you into the fence. And I saw that with Blahal. I mean, Blahal came right across that cage all five rounds, including the rounds where in between you believe that he's going to fatigue. And he had the math on his side. I mean, eventually he just needs to close that match out. He just got to beat the clock is what I'm talking about. But he still came across. And he still put him in that fence and he still took him down. And it was rinse and repeat. And Daniel, not only were those takedowns fantastic... His striking was fantastic. Not one of those takedowns happened without strikes first. He was staying in his face. It was almost a rhythm. Bop, 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 bop. But it was almost a rhythm when a guy's punching you that much. And I've only had that experience once. It was in training against Joe Schilling. But when a guy is punching you that much, it blinds you. You can't see. I mean, the punches are constantly coming at you. It's a great way to set up your shot. And when we do look at Blah Hall, I got to go back to this. Daniel, I don't know when he had the time to get so much better. In theory, and this theory usually doesn't work out for guys, but you could work on one area. You could increase your uh-huh. wrestling. You could increase your scramble, but you got to pick one. He, he comes out, he's a better boxer, and he's a better grappler that's applying the pressure. Look, I'll tell you one other thing. Leon said that he felt tired, so that puts a little bit of a, a hole in the boat of my argument. But the argument I was going to make to you, Daniel, is I, fought Le- I thought Leon fought very well. I didn't think it was a matter of Leon underperforming or leaving his skills in the locker room. He came out, he won the fifth round. He was looking for the finish. He knew what time it was. He knew what was going on. We found a better fighter. At least that night, we found a better fighter. And that is really what I felt that I saw. You know, Bilal just looked better, and he looked better against Gilbert Burns. And it is just continuing to go every fight. He's a better fighter. His pace is pressure. He literally outstruck Leon Edwards on the feet, which was not something any of us expected going into this fight but before we go hey chill end of the fight i said give it up to your champion and i said leon edwards first i apologize to my friend Bilal muhammad it was i was tired 6 a.m my bad my guy i looked at leon and when i looked at leon i said his name but as you know you are the welterweight champion of the world and you deserve it Bilal muhammad so great job to him and his entire team chill the co-main event tom aspinall continues to Build a a claim that he is the best heavyweight in the world. So I say continues to build the claim because there are going to be many people that still believe John Jones is the best heavyweight in the world. But we have seen a sample size of what John can do at heavyweight against Cyril Gaon. We have seen the entire buffet or the entree of what Tom Aspinall can do at heavyweight. And what we have seen is that Tom Aspinall can't be touched by any of these dudes, at least to my eyes, what did you make of his performance? And how dangerous is this guy to reign atop this division for a long time? At the end of your final thought a moment ago on Blahal and Leon, you came out with what I believe is an apology or a correction to a mistake yes. that we all knew and you did. Well, is that like keeping you up at night? What, what, what was that? Did somebody tell you to apologize to him? Where did that come no. from? You made a mistake. It was six in the morning. So what? What, 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 what are you doing apologizing? No, no, no. Just because I don't want to, I don't, you, 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 it, it hurts a man's moment. That's a big moment for Bilal, and I just hate that I made that mistake in that moment. And now you made so a unique form, you made too. a special. All right. I accept that, big guy, and I want to tell you this, Aspinall, holy smokes. Hey, Daniel, let me tell you a scary story real fast. Here's the scary story. Tom Aspinall didn't fight very well. Here's the scary story. Curtis Blades had the perfect game plan, could come across the ring to start touching him, to start exchanging and slipping out of the way so that he wasn't touched back. He did all of those things. What happens in that moment is Tom knows one of these combos by Curtis is going to be a trick. He's going to lay a trap to set me up, and that's when he's going to come underneath me and take me down, and I am taking on a great big man who, by the way, is a junior college national champion. These thoughts are going on in Tom's head. What happens when you have those thoughts, you're not getting your offense going. What happens is your hands are just a little bit low. What happens, you're a little bit slower. Tom knocked him out with in spite of everything that I just said, that was not the most perfect one minute of Tom's career. He knocked him out. Daniel, this is the third big man he's put down with one shot. Excuse me. Mike Tyson did not put down the guys that were 250 plus, not with one shot. It took him a lot of work and a lot of setups. I mean, we're seeing referees jumping in there so fast. The reason, if you're sitting at home, the referee can hear, the referee can feel, the referee can sense the speed, the power, the ferocity of these punches that he's stepping in in one shot when most guys would have four or five. I've really not seen a heavyweight like this. I'm just starting to see what Michael Bisping talked about. I believed in Tom. I believe that Tom is great. I did not know he was this good. You know, Chael, 
I watched this man dispose of Curtis Blades in a way that I wasn't expected for one reason, Chael. Last time they, they fought, right? I know it was 15 seconds. I know Tom hurt himself. But even that, even in that, you wonder, man, what does this guy have for me? Last week, you made a point. When they started last time, Curtis was able to hit him one, two. Bam, bam. Right? Even that should have given Tom a little bit of a pause before he approached him. But he didn't. And then when Tom went in the first time, Curtis hit him with a left hook. Tom said, I didn't think he would catch me with it because I didn't know he had that length to his strikes. So what does Aspinall do, Chael Sonnen? Aspinall gets back to space. Then he goes and does the same thing again. And this time, he knocks him out. He attacked Curtis Blades. Like, Curtis Blades posed no threat to him. And that, to me, is special. The last guy we saw do that in the UFC was Francis Ngannou. Francis Ngannou knew that if he could land one, he would put these guys out. So if you had any type of, uh, any skill that could be a threat to him, you better use it right away because if you didn't, he was going to knock you out. Tom Aspinall is operating under the same way, where he goes after you. He says, I'm going to make you fight me right now because I believe that if I can land, I'm going to put you out. I thought that punch would have stopped him a little bit and made him go, hold on a second. This guy's ready, especially after all week Curtis is talking of the, the improvements he's made. And then, bink, bink. Dude, the jab, Chael, the jab is what hurt Curtis really bad. And then the right hand skimmed him. It skimmed Curtis Blades and put him down. There are people saying the stoppage was too soon. To your point, Chael, the stoppage comes fast when you have an ultra-dangerous guy on top of a person that looks helpless. And that is why they jump in quickly, because it seems as though Tom Aspinall, when he's finishing someone, is going to hurt him really badly. Yeah. Daniel, I, I love that analysis. And what a difference a day can make. Uh... The talk was Poton, Alex Pejera, possibly going to heavyweight, possibly taking on Tom, possibly taking on John Jones. I feel like that train stopped. I mean, it came to a screeching halt. And the same thing happened to John Jones last November when Tom goes out to Madison Square Garden, ends up defeating Sergey Pavlich. All the talk at that time was John versus Pavlich. And that switched over to Tom. It, it goes over to Poton. Now it's back to Tom. And I'm just suggesting for you, like, this is a very interesting time because what comes next, and I know the headlines today, and they even had a quote from Dana to support them, is that it's going to be Tom versus the winner of John and Stipe. Not so fast. I really don't feel that we should wait for that, Daniel. That isn't scheduled until November of this year. We wouldn't get those two big boys in there until a best-case scenario, possibly International Fight Week of next year. And by the way, that's discounting Stipe. If Stipe is to get the jump on John and not retire, it's going to be Stipe versus John again, just for example. So I think that if we look at that, and we take our oars out of the water and stare at the board a little bit, Tom's going to need to find himself something to do. So the talk of Piera versus Jones, I think, is less likely than perhaps lead Tom versus Piera. I'm not predicting that for you, but what I am suggesting is he's going to do something before he sees the winner of John and Stipe, and I hope you followed that. I know that sounded like a riddle, but every word was true. You know, what's crazy, Chael, is it might sound a lot, but honestly, the, the, the interim champion had a lot of the same thoughts. At his post-fight press conference, he said this, Chael. Here's a thought for you. I was thinking about this the other day. What, what about, so they're saying that Stipe and John Jones are going to fight in um, MSG in November. Why don't we do a tournament? We'll do John, Stipe, me, Alex, and do a four-man tournament, two fights in one night, and let's find out who the real heavyweight champion in the world is like. We've got the, the best heavyweight of all time. We've got the, the best MMA fighter of all time. We've got the light heavyweight champion, and then we've got me, who's just a poxy interim champion. Do you know what I mean? Let's, let's do that, two fights in one night. So, so chill. This is cool, right? Because I remember when I was wrestling, we used to go to Russia. They would take the top eight light heavyweights, which was 211 at the time. They would take the top eight heavyweights and they would wrestle tournaments. It was called the Super World Championship. And what would happen is whoever won that 211 bracket would wrestle the heavyweight champion at heavyweight. And then that was how they determined the Super World Champion. 
to me, that sounds like what Tom Aspinall is suggesting. Dude, if anyone in that combination of people is like, I don't know if I necessarily want to do this, and it's like you saying how quickly things change. To me, it's Alex Pereira now. Because if I'm Alex Pereira, I'm looking at what Tom Aspinall is doing heavyweights and going, eh, I don't know if I want to fight this guy. Partly because if Tom can't strike with him, Tom still possesses wrestling. Yeah, we don't even see this guy using the skill that he possesses because he's doing so well with his hands. What do you think about this two fights in one night tournament that Tom Aspinall suggested? Well, and we're just having fun here. We don't need comment sections and people telling us the commission wouldn't sanction it. But if we're having fun here, there is no better way, in fact, there's probably no other way, of finding out who is truly the best unless you have a competitive architecture. So if you want to put a bracket together, even if it's a four-man bracket, the right guy is going to come out the other side of that. Now, I would like to weigh in here because this goes back to a point that I was just making where I do believe Aspinall is going to need to find something to do between now and his next fight if the opponent is going to be the winner of Stipe versus Jones. It's, it, it is interesting, though. There's some room for Surreal gone to, sl uh, to slide in. There's room for another heavyweight to speak up and get his name out there, but not necessarily because Tom hasn't just put one layer between him, which is Dana's idea that he's going to take on the winner of Jones and Stipe. He's now put another layer, which is himself versus Alex Payera. So for another heavyweight to break in and get the headlines, he doesn't have to just beat one guy out. He's got to now beat two guys out. And I just like the idea of Tom. Listen, I don't love these first round stoppages, Daniel. Uh, I mean, I maintain the reason that Ronda Rousey lost to Holly Holm was not the high head kick. It was because her previous six fights were over so quickly. I want to see Tom breathe a little bit. I want to see what he does when his eye is black and when his nose is turned sideways, when the fourth round is coming. But if he's so good but, that nobody can get him sure. there, it's a tough spot, right? That's it's a tough spot say. to critique. That's what I was going to say. Can they get him there? Chael, if you look down the heavyweight rankings right now, who do you think can actually get him to that point outside of the two that are going to fight in Madison Square Garden? So that's why it makes more sense. Dude, he did everything right. The crowd loved him. The people loved him. I got to say something, though, Chill. You and I were good on the mic. I was good. You were great. Um, but I do know the best way to get a fight is to be disrespectful. Tom Aspinall's not that guy. In the octagon, I tried to tee Tom up to say something to John Jones to goad him into a fight. This is what Tom said. Hello, John. I have nothing against you personally. But I just think I'm better than you. I just know that I can beat you in a fight. So I'm coming for it. Chill, 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 chill. I mean, Leia, Tom Aspinall. What do you have to say to John? He's watching. You know he's watching, Chill. He watches your tweets. So you know he's watching the fight. He's watching Tom. Tell him something, Tom. What do you say to John Jones? John, I have nothing against you personally, but I would like to fight you. What did you do in that moment? I literally, like, if I'm at home watching that, I throw something on the ground. Bang. Oh, my God. He done blew it. He finally did something wrong. What do you, what did you make of it? <sighs> I also looked at it from the respectful standpoint, and there's a way to the top if you take that path, but boy, there's no turns in the road. I mean, you're not going to get any shortcuts anywhere. You're going to have to get there. Listen, the one thing that Tom does need is the mandate of John Jones. He needs John to start firing back. John Jones, while being better than other humans athletically, emotionally is a lot like other humans. John Jones wants credit too. He wants to go out, he wants to beat the top guys, and then he would like some people to pat him on the back and tell him good job. He thought that's what he had here with Stipe. He moves up in weight class. Stipe is said to be the greatest heavyweight ever. I believe that is because he had more title defenses, but either way, he does take that moniker around, and all of a sudden they're taking that from John. It's a foregone conclusion. They're looking right past him. You got two guys coming after you. Both got world titles. One's named Alex Pereira. One, one is named Tom Aspinall, and the fans are saying they will either see either one of those than you versus Stipe, and this is just what fans do, right? Like, There's nothing unique about this, but in John's world, it feels unique. It feels like I can't get a break. It feels like, wait a minute, I'm coming into a weight class that I've only done one time. I'm coming off of an injury and you still have these level of expectations on me and you still think I'm ducking and dodging people. The whole reason I came up here is to show you my level of courage. So it's a hard spot. It's a very tricky situation, and I think 
think that Tom, and I'd like to give him this one defense, Daniel, he, he, that did not have the vigor on it. That did not have something on, that has to warrant a response and upset John Jones. Listen, when I got the fight with John Jones, I said that he was, that if, if we were kids on Halloween, I'd have pushed him down and taken his candy. That was the line. And you, you might think, so what? I kind of thought, so what, too? John got all kinds of upset. Like, maybe he had a flashback where somebody did push him down and take it. For whatever it was, though, you got to get him the right way. And to your point, partner, that was not it. However, he's not having that fight next anyhow, so maybe he's buying himself just a little bit of time. These guys are pretending to be angry at each other as a way of throwing them off their game. Some guys pretend that they like you, and they pretend to be nice to throw you off your game. Chill, can I be honest, Chill? Every fight I've picked, I've never done it respectfully. And I think that pretty much just is the root of it. You know, any guy that picks a fight, the way to get that fight is not through respect. Chill, do you remember when Patrick Cummins was working at Starbucks? Of course. And he picked a fight with me? Of course. He did it not with respect. He said the most disrespectful stuff of all time. So Dana White goes, hold on. The guy from Starbucks made DC crying wrestling practice. Okay, let's let him fight. When I fight John Jones, it was never respectful. You have to do it in a way that makes him respond, especially when you're dealing with someone like Jones. Because you got to know the target, Chill. If I if I was to want to fight you and, and you saw it coming, oh, I know what he's doing. I know what he, you would be like, I know what he's doing. I'm not going to play into it. John doesn't. Anytime you disrespect him, he takes it as, oh, my God, this guy's disrespecting me. So he responds. That is why he responds to fans and he responds to people on the internet because he doesn't like the disrespect. Fighters in general do not love getting disrespected. I've had times in airport jail. One guy told me, he goes, uh, we were coming through pre-check. I was grabbing my bag. I was taking a little longer than he wanted me to. And he goes, oh, I guess you don't travel much. The guy told me this. Chill, my blood was boiling boiling the entire time that I walked from the security <laughs> checkpoint to the gate because we don't get disrespected. So when someone disrespects you, you want to kick their ass. It is what it is. And that's what Tom Aspinall needed to do. That was the only thing that I could do to give him a negative grade on last weekend. But ultimately, Chell, I believe that we are looking at the best heavyweight on the planet because I don't know, man, if John Jones will beat this guy, but I will not be quick to say John Jones is afraid of him or that is a foregone conclusion that John that he beats John because I've been in there with Jones. I know how tough he is. I know how smart he is, and I know how much he loves to compete. And if you love to compete as much as that guy does, he can never be counted out of a fight. Yeah. You know, the third fight from the top was Patty Pimlet versus King Green. Not King Bobby Green, just King Green. Everybody in the know, thought this would be the hardest fight Patty Pimblett has ever had because Bobby is so, or King Green is so talented, he has such good striking, and he's such a veteran. Turns out, it wasn't the toughest fight of Pimblett's career. Dare I say, it was one of the easier fights in Pimblett's career because Pimblett didn't even get touched. Bobby was never able to find range Patty gets a submission, triangle armbar. What did you make of Patty's performance? And is this an indicator for what his future looks like? Or was this simply uh, King Green should not have shot and grappled with this kid? He should have made it a stand-up fight. Patty enters into the top 15 and he's going to struggle. Patty used to be called Patty the Fatty. And they would tease him. They'd follow his diet. He liked to get real big in between fights. And it was kind of a yo-yo, and he liked to come down. I had some real concerns going into this matchup. First off, Bobby's got the skills to deal with him. But Bobby's got the activity and the experience to make him look bad. And I'm talking about Patty here. But one thing I didn't see with Patty, don't forget, this is only his second fight in 16 months. After Flash Gordon, that controversy, he, he had a knee injury. So this is only Patty's second walkout there. He's got to do it in front of the home crowd. 
But I never saw that yo-yo diet. Uh, I never saw him really go up and go down. And I don't know if that speaks to a new mindset, a little more professionalism, changing of his physiology. But I do feel that it's an interesting tie-in. And I used to believe that Patty was a regional fighter. What do I mean by that? Well, he can sell a lot of tickets at a specific venue. So keep bringing him to that geographic location. You can't main event the guy. You can't five-round him. You can't move him up the rankings too fast. But bring in the right opponent. And we're going to have some fun for three or four years. I don't see Patty that same way anymore. Patty is two fights away, Daniel. They got to be the right two fights. But he is two fights away to fighting for a world championship. And I don't just mean that Dana would sign the match. I mean that guys like you and I would be telling the community, this is the right uh, matchup. I, I, I love these uh, rankings right here. But if they were to keep going, eventually they're going to come to a name called Michael Chandler. And if Michael Chandler does not get the fight with Connor, this to me looks like the perfect replacement. Hey, Chael, looking at that 15 to 10, though, he called out Hanato Moicano. But when you look at those matchups, those are some dangerous matchups for Patty Pimblett. Look, I was of the belief that the kid was good. I really didn't feel that he wasn't going to be viable. I didn't know that he would be as good as, say, a Conor McGregor. Because everybody, every time we get one of these European guys, they come in with all this hype, they do well initially. We want to compare them to Connor. Nobody's Connor. Nobody's going to run through the rankings like Connor did, and nobody's going to win their way to the world championship like Connor did. Doesn't make much sense. But this kid on the weekend showed me that if you fight him where he's comfortable, he can beat anybody. We have not seen King Green get submitted in the UFC before. We have not seen it happen. So I believe that Paddy Pimblett now will move into the top 15. If he gets the Moicano fight, he'll be top 10 because that's where Moicano is. And this kid has a star quality about him. Chill. that arena was going crazy. That song that he plays, and he does that weird dance there with his hands. You see that weird dance he does with his hands? Yeah. People do that in the crowd. They wear those little wig things that he wears, like the Brady Bunch. I mean, he is popular. I know he might not be as popular in the United States for some reason, because people have turned on him. But if he continues to win in the way that he does now, Patty Pimblett is a massive star. It can be very important for the UFC going forward. Uh, and I love the guy's messages in the octagon. He he really does. Uh, he talked about a kid that passed away, lost his life to cancer. He dedicated the fight to him. He's really shined the light on mental health. Uh, the guy is trying to do the right thing. I was proud of Patty Pimlet on Saturday. I thought he had tremendous performance on the mic and inside the octagon. I All right, Chael. So... You got something to say? Well, I would just like you to, say to say, that I come away with that same assessment, Daniel. I, I also don't look at him as the trash-talking fun guy with a with a weird haircut. I also find that he has very mature messages. Let's not forget, uh, Dave Porton and I flew out to watch him fight. He and Molly were on the same card. Drake bet half a million dollars to the point that he rewarded them with Rolexes, but we found out after that fight that he had just lost a friend. He had just lost a loved one, and he was carrying that with him. He was carrying that through the weight cut, through the walkout, through all the hype, and it was everybody coming against him. That almost felt like the shtick. Patty's on one side and everybody's turning on him. But as we get to know this guy, that's not who he is. And he's not putting himself on an island all by himself, throwing up middle fingers to everybody. He re-signed with the organization. He showed respect to the company. He said, this is where I want to be. It was his second fight in 16 months. But to get that done, he had to get uh, control on his weight class and rehab in ACL. He is showing a true dedication. And I love that you said those nice words about him because I am beginning to see him on a character level. On a, the way, This sport doesn't create character like some believe. It reveals character character and daniel he is passing the test he absolutely is you know i love watching the kid hey hey kid's a big lightweight he looked way bigger than king green inside the octagon and i think his length and his size is why green took that bad shot that ultimately failed him and led him to get submitted okay so chill next we have perth australia but then we get to the sphere so much has been made about the sphere finally we get some answers. Dana White announced the fight card for the Sphere and Chill. It is good. The main event features the Bantamweight Championship fight between Sean O'Malley and Marab Dualashvili. Alexa Grasso fights Valentina Shevchenko for the third time. Brian Ortega and Diego Lopez gets rescheduled from UFC 303 down to the Sphere. Zell Huber versus Ribovich. We also have Ronaldo Rodriguez versus Ode Osborne. Chill, that's a great fight card. But you know as fans, right, it's never enough. Okay, let's get to the prelims. Irene Aldana takes on Norma DeMont, and Raul Rosas Jr. 
starts tonight against Enrique Lane. Guys, it is a massive amount of Mexican fighters, as it should be. It's Mexican Independence Day. Ignacio Bahamundes and Manuel Torres. So many great fighters. But Chael, as fans, we're never happy. Chael, you could give me... You're, 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 oh, there you go. Look at that. Marab and O'Malley. O'Malley's got a new haircut. Oh, look. Hey, Chael, Valentina's going. Valentina's like, hey, I get my title fight. Sure, it's Mexican Independence Day. I get an opportunity. No Chael UFC Chael goes down in September. How excited are you for what happens inside the sphere? This is going to be the greatest, most stimulating event in the history of recorded vision and sound. And that is what Dana White has <laughs> promised us and nothing less. I cannot believe how out of control this event has got. UFC 300 was right behind us, was supposed to be the biggest event of all time. 100 to only be beaten by 200 and 200 to only be beaten by 300, at least within theory. Daniel, this is going to be the one. I, When Dana came out and said, I just don't think he meant this to be this big of a deal. When he came out and said, we're never going back. No. This is a one-off and a one-time deal. Everybody was coming out of the woodwork. We had retired guys, George Masvidal, Nate Diaz, just for example, asking <laughs> if they could come back. We had Conor McGregor starting to lobby for it. Like, they were yeah. coming in. And we finally got it. The sport's biggest star, Sean O'Malley, taking on Marab, and Marab has come into his own. Marab, to remind you, and I have not checked this since post fight 299 in Miami, partner. Marab was the favorite. He was a two to one favorite to beat yeah. O'Malley. I don't know that that line hasn't changed. I referenced something that was three days ago. I'm just sharing with you. This is the one. I have never cared about a building. Shine my own uh, wheels here. I got to compete at Madison Square Garden. It didn't mean very much to me. Other people would ask me about it. It was just a building to me. I, even as a fan, am feeling something special about the sphere. You know, when he said it, right, and he goes, this is going to be the greatest event of all time. It's the promoter doing his job. And then eventually, everybody took him serious. All the fighters took him serious. All the fans took him serious. Everybody goes, oh, it is? Okay, now you got to give us the greatest event of all time. I think the greatest event of all time is not only going to be in the fight store, but in the environment. That is where people need to understand that the names, it does not match UFC 300. But in terms of the environment, this fight card is going to be so sick. I cannot wait, bro. The UFC Noche. Hey, Chael, I was there last year. It was in T-Mobile Arena. The environment was crazy. So many Mexican flags and dude jerseys. They were selling Noche UFC jerseys. They were green, white, and red in the Mexican colors. And all night, all night, they played Mexican mariachi music. It was the greatest thing ever. I had so much fun, Chill. Chill, I'm in my seat doing stuff like this. I can't salsa dance, Chill. <laughs> but I can move my shoulders if I do. So I have people online going, DC knows how to salsa. Gilroy's treating them good. But if you can only see my feet, they're just staying still because I can't move my feet in unison with my shoulders to make it look like I can salsa dance. It was an amazing night. I cannot wait for Noche UFC. But again, Chill, we are fans. Chill, you could give me a million dollars. And I would walk away, say, Chael, you and I sold something, and we made $2 million, $2.4 million. And you said, okay, DC, we're going $1.2 million and $1.2 million, we're splitting it down the middle. I would say, well, why didn't I get $1.2 million and $1? Because I always want more. You, Everybody wants more. We can never be satisfied, Chael. So that got me thinking. No, Chael, UFC is a great card, but it's missing something, right? It has to be missing something because it, it can't just be perfect. So if we got to add one, Chael, what would you add in terms of a fight? I don't need a moment to think about that. My $1.2 <laughs> million plus $1 is going to be a Vincenzo Luque standing across from Nick Diaz. And there's room for it. By the way, ah. that's not just a dream fight. There's room for it. They were booked and they were signed that far. Uh, came apart. We were never yep. told why. But we were led to believe that it's not illness or injury on behalf of either guy. So that's I think we just take that fight. We just need to get it another date. If I could add a fight to it, because I'm being realistic, right? I'm not doing a dream. George St. Pierre versus Khabib. Not being very realistic. What fights could we do? Vincenzo Luque and Nick Diaz. That's a good one. That's a good one. You know, from Mino Chael, I think Alexa Grosso is now the face of Mexican mixed martial arts. She is the champion. Brandon Moreno had a good run as the champion. But there's only been one guy that is the most recognizable Mexican fighter in the UFC. 
over the course of the last five years is Jair Rodriguez. Why is Jair Rodriguez not on this fight card? I say put him on against Calvin Cater, chill. Jair Rodriguez, Calvin Cater at featherweight, one. You're going to get a guy who Mexican fans absolutely adore. And two, you're going to get a guy that Mexican fans absolutely adore in a fight against a guy that absolutely brings it. So it would be a fun fight, high-level fight, and it would spotlight the guy that I feel has been as important to Mexican mixed martial arts as anyone since 2016-17. He's been fighting right around the top of the featherweight division. So Yair Rodriguez, Calvin Cater, book it, put it on Noche UFC, and listen to the crowd explode whenever he hits a curtain. One thing I will say, though, Chael, because the sphere is once in a lifetime, I do not anticipate that the Mexican fighters, even though it's Mexican Independence Day, will hold as much of an advantage as they did last year in T-Mobile Arena. Because I think the crowd is going to be uh, much more diversified because of the once-in-a-lifetime experience of watching the UFC inside the sphere. You agree? Yeah, I think that's a great analysis. And, and, and when you gave it, my mind instantly went to Shevchenko Grosso. Shevchenko's the one that said that. She didn't like the decision. You know what? Tyson Fury took a lot of heat. Tyson Fury lost a decision fight to Usyk, but Usyk is representing the Ukraine, whose country is at war. And those were Tyson's exact words. And people were furious that he said it. Hey, I understood it. Maybe that's just because I know judges, but they're human beings too. They read the headlines too. They get infected by, by, by the emotion of the crowd as well now they try to uh, be aware of that and they try to block it out and do their job but there's a big difference in try and being a human being and i do think that your point <laughs> is very relevant i would be curious if the bullet agrees yeah absolutely it's gonna be a great fight night though i cannot wait to get to noche ufc uh inside the sphere all right chill, let's get to this week in mma history this week in mma history seven years ago chill to this day i think yeah July 29th, 2017, Daniel Cormier versus John Jones 2. What did you think? What do you remember about that fight on that night? Because, Chill, guess what? You know who doesn't remember much about it? Me. Because oh. I got knocked out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, allow me to tell you what happened. But, I mean, this was anticipation <laughs> at its absolute height. You asked what I remember about that fight. It was a blur. I got both fights in my head. I mean, I got all the way from Dave Schaller getting pushed down and John Anik getting blamed for it, all the way down to the press conferences where he said, I took cocaine and I still was able to prepare to beat you. I mean, I'm just sharing. It was one of these really remarkable fights. And I do remember yelling at my screen, Daniel, take him down. Down. I don't feel yeah. that your wrestling yeah. was as nullified as some people might remember it. I feel that you didn't attempt quite enough wrestling. That's my critique. It was an amazing night. And I say that out of respect, <laughs> but that's what I remember about fight two. You know, it, you know why I didn't take him down? The striking was going too good. It was going too good. Every single thing we trained was working to the point that I feel like I got a bit arrogant. I was like talking to him and it just was working so well. But you don't play with fire like that with a guy like John Jones. You know what else I remember about that? That week, Chael, it was so uh, much bad blood surrounding those fights that every time my team got close to his team, they would start fighting each other. It was, hey, I got him on this one, Chael. This is the one whenever he said, look at you. You look sick. You look like a crackhead. I go, well, at least I've never been one. That was one of my greatest lines at a press conference ever, Chael. And he was like, okay, you got me. But it was intensity. This is one of the greatest rivalries the UFC has ever seen. It was so fun to live in it. But you know what happened the, once? His Daniel, brother was in the no, NFL. No, Daniel, the hold on. Hold on just a second. You got to let me take in here. That, that was a misrepresentation. There was not a new champion. The title did not change hands. And that did not end by TKO. The official ruling on that was a no contest. John Jones failed his drug test. They gave that belt back. But the way that we are to look at that as fans and as ranking committees, per the Nevada State Athletic Commission, is that it was a no contest. That is officially what happened. Yeah, absolutely. Officially, it wasn't no contest. But, chill. like I was going to say, there was so much bad blood that I had this training partner named Crazy Frank Munoz. He was a kickboxer from Spain. He was out of his mind. I know Crazy and Frank. every time they got close to each other, they would get to fighting. And in that weigh-ins, my team is there. His team is there. But this time, chill, John's brother, 
the NFL guy is there. Frank is trying to take a picture with this dude so that he gets booted off of my team. So now Frank has no island. They don't want him on Jones' team. Now my team don't want him. And he's stuck in the middle. Now he's trying to fight my team. It was the craziest week of my entire life, but it was so fun to be in there, bro. That crowd chill was so hot that that octagon was shaking. Ooh, like my feet, I could feel the energy going through my feet as we were getting ready to fight. That is... That was one of my best fights. I had so much fun in that fight. It was tremendous. That's amazing. Tail. And I'm, I'm really glad that you left there with some positive memories because that's that's how that is deserved to be remembered. Good for you. And one thing, I got to give a quick shout out to Arthur Jones. You and Arthur never got it right. He's the one that you called John's fat brother from the NFL. <laughs> Arthur's actually a very nice guy. I got to just throw that at you. I don't do that very often. But Arthur's a gentleman <laughs> if you got to know him. I remember, Chill, hey, our families would fight. I remember being in Buffalo. And Arthur's fat ass is talking to me, and I'm looking at him going, what are you going to do? Because you can't do nothing. <laughs> Jones can do stuff. What are you going to do, Arthur? You sit down before I come out there and smack you. All right, Chael, another great show. Good guy, bad guy. Guys, you can catch Chael and I every Monday and Thursday, wherever you get your podcast, ESPN MMA YouTube, ESPN2. Uh, for Chael Sonnen, I'm Daniel Cormier. We'll catch you on the next one. Go Gunners! Go Arsenal!